Frank Seppi with Arash Rabar here for Dog Walk and Talk. We got Neo Shiba Inu. Neo, give your best side. There he is. And who do we got here, Arash? We got Enzo. Enzo. He's uh, my Italian Persian pit bull. <laughs> He's a gentleman and a scholar. <laughs> I'm Enzo, the baker. Very good, very good boy. <laughs> And they're actually, they're getting along. They're actually getting along, right? Yeah. They're not, I mean, Neo growled at him. They're minding their own business. Enzo's very, very friendly. He's, you know. I told Neo it's like, you know, fighting an MMA fighter, or pit bulls. <laughs> <laughs> He's gonna get killed. Enzo actually was a little bit more jacked and ripped when I got him. He lost some muscle tone, which is a little upsetting, but. What's his next show? His next show, we're, we're, we're shooting he for. Qual he's qualified for 2023 Atlantic States. So. <laughs> he's doing the yeah. universe. Neo, as I said before, I, he's off season, man. He's like. He's going through severe bulking state, and then he's gonna shred the hell up, right? <laughs> he's from Japan, right? So he'd be he's a well big, conditioned. He's a mini sumo wrestler. That's it. <laughs> yeah. So you know what? Again, we're at the park. We got our dogs. And we're... all right, cool. So we talk about the bodybuilders in the '90s. So yeah. So that was when it took off for me. Following the guys in the '90s, I started emulating Dorian, Kevin LeBron, Ronnie mm -hmm. Coleman. I'd watch their videos the night before, train the next day, and I mean, I didn't know what grits were until I, I was watching Ronnie and I started eating grits. <laughs> and it just it just kind of took off for me, and I really bodybuilded like that for 21 years before I ever even stepped on stage, wow. which is which is interesting. I, actually, you know what? Let's cut this way. I um, remember probably maybe 10, 12 years ago, we did a shoot for Metrics, and you haven't competed yet at that time. Oh my time. God, I don't know why. Frank Seppi called me to do a shoot, and like Frank Seppi's so calling me. So you're in the gym, yeah. So I'm, I'm like, how am, I, how am I gonna say no? Well, I should have said no. <laughs> I, I mean, it was, in, I was in terrible shape. I mean, listen, I was a small guy, yeah. and I had done a couple shows, and I'd rebounded from the shows, and I was just, you know, didn't look like a lot of guys look on social media these days. And Frank's like, oh, don't worry about it. And he talked me into doing it. In retrospect, I should not have done it. You know, I Those actually. pictures are for sale right now. I went out, no, please, no. I'm gonna pay someone to delete them off the internet. I remember I went out when he told me, I was like, damn, what am I gonna do? Yeah. I was like, the only thing I could possibly do is try to drop some water. I went out and bought like dandelion root, like this big, like a bunch of actual dandelion. I was like eating it and chewing on it, and that stuff is disgusting, and it didn't help at all. You know, it's funny. You're talking about dandelion root and you're talking about being in the industry and you get on a moment's notice you have to be ready for a magazine cover yeah. or this or that. So I would do dandelion root, uva ursa, cider vinegar, B6, and on top of that eat like three pounds of asparagus a day to get out my Yeah, but you were <laughs> lean. But, but you were lean. Yeah, but I mean you'd lose like five to six pounds yeah, in like easily. two, three days. But he was lean. I was not lean. I've never, you know, it, it was himself. an amazing, fine. and back then for, for Frank Seppert, if you asked me to do that, it was a big Metrics. deal, yep. and I would never turn down an opportunity. I've never still, to this day, haven't. So for those of you out there that are getting started, amateurs, if you have an opportunity to film with someone, shoot with someone, even if it's not a big page, just a yeah. collaboration, take it. You know, it's funny, back in the day, and I look apart, like when I started fitness modeling and everything else, and I would do a ton of stuff for free. You know, I would like, okay, I'm going to do this for free, I'm going to do this for free. And it was always a springboard to something else. Yeah. The mentality of a lot of people now is they're so lazy and so unmotivated. And when you say, hey, do you want to do a shoot or this or that? They're like, well, they have to think about it. When you're passionate about something and Adam, like, you'd be like, yeah, I'll do it. You don't even think about it. You worry about the money later on. Like, Absolutely. you know what I'm saying? Like, just to get your foot in the door. It's to, to be honest with you, like... You know, in the beginning, I, you know, I was more shy and I was more nervous behind camera. But after I kind of got my footing and I realized that I liked, I enjoyed being behind camera. I don't want to say more than being on stage, but just as much because it gave me a platform yeah. and it gave me an opportunity to speak. So anytime someone was filming or doing something, you know, I would just love to talk. I've been bodybuilding, right, for since I was 13. So I've learned a lot and I have a lot to share and it excites me to tell people what I've learned and right. people that are excited to listen. I actually, when we're at Bev's after the workout, we usually go in the sauna mm -hmm. and we've accumulated a couple groups. One group is a, a lot of young, a couple young guys like in their early twenties. And another group is a couple older guys in their sixties. And I, I want to start filming you with a GoPro <laughs> and call it the sauna chronicles. The sauna chronicles. We get into deep conversation about yeah. fitness, men's health, mm -hmm. um, business, longevity, mindset, the law of attraction. And it's actually a lot of good, a lot of good content. Don't you feel like the era that you grew up in and everything that bodybuilding has become a microcosm for everything in the fitness industry, whether it's a 
uh, an Atkins diet, whether it's the keto, whether it's everything. Bodybuilders have been doing it since the 60s and 70s. Yeah. You know, everything is just kind of repackaged, refurbished. And then, you know, there's certain workouts too that you would look back on the guy, bodybuilders in the 50s and like, that's that guy's routine. Yeah, it just keeps getting recycled. It just recycled, yeah. And that's the interesting thing I always said about bodybuilding because it's, it's not the most popular sport, you know, like the NBA, NFL. No. I mean, bodybuilding is not the most popular sport, but it's very interesting. People have more in common with bodybuilders than any other athlete. You could be a basketball player. You look up to LeBron James. Yeah. LeBron James is on another level genetically. You'll never, it doesn't matter how hard you work. True. But all people can learn and have learned from bodybuilders. All of these diets, mm -hmm. the Atkins diet, carb cycling, CrossFitters, celebrities, movie stars, when they're getting ready for roles, yep. everything that they're doing, wellness clinics. Now you have a lot of wealthy people going to these well, wellness youth centers. Sure. It's all stuff that was learned and trickled down from bodybuilding over the past 50 years. Right, there's a reason why supplement companies spend millions and millions of dollars to promote in the bodybuilding industry. Because whether you, you look at LeBron James, some people can't relate to basketball plays unless they're playing that specific sport or they, you know, they have that height. Bodybuilding always had somebody that you can resonate with and kind of want to look like. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, and then those were the guys who had the extreme physiques. So that was kind of reason why they would kind of, you know, look, gravitate more to a bodybuilding fitness. Like if you ask somebody right now, hey, who do you want to look like? A lot of people, in my experience, say Chris Bumstead. And I'm like, wow, Chris Bumstead, you know who he is? Well, they know who Sadiq is. Like, these people are becoming bigger and bigger because of social media. And you'll see that even celebrities are following. Like, we have Dave Batista's and other people yeah. are following a lot of the people in the sport. Shaq. So, you know, that's obviously due to the Olympia exposure to Olympia and the giant, you know, explosion of bodybuilding and fitness from the IFBB Pro League and NPC. So Absolutely. You know, where is it's it's relatable because people, you know, want to be the best versions of themselves. And it's not relatable because people see some like the open bodybuilders that are massive and they're just yeah. like they can't comprehend how is this guy so lean? Why is he so shiny? Why is there you no know, hair on his body? You know, you know what it's annoying to me now is like you were just saying about the TRT clinics and you're talking about, you know, supplements and everything like this. When you see somebody who's shredded and who's in fantastic shape, it automatically say, they, well, they're on steroids, they're on drugs, they're on this or that, and that's all they have to do. If that was the case, everybody in the world would take that magic <laughs> pill and, and not work out, not diet, not like, you know, not stay consistent and, you know, be in shape, so. I think if you show how many <laughs> people take these anabolic steroids, these performance enhancing drugs, yeah. and you showed their pictures, the average gym rats that take them and don't look like anything spectacular, then you'd understand. But even, even natural bodybuilders, even natural bodybuilding, when you show a natural bodybuilder, 4% yeah. body fat. Oh, they're phenomenal. Tanned, yep. no hair. That doesn't look natural to the layman, yeah. uh, to the layman eye as well. When I was, you know, I got very, very far naturally, turned pro naturally, and mm -hmm. I got the same thing. Yeah. Nowadays, the sad thing is you have one bump, you have one one pack, not yeah. one pack, or one those, vein in your arm. Everybody's quick to say they'll spot steroids. it out. You know, it's funny when I was a teenager, right? Like, go get ready for spring break. These kids in the gym, everybody was on juice. They'd all be fat, like bulky and swollen, and then summer's over, they would just like become a flubber version of themselves, exactly. skinny fat. So it was like, well, if they're taking the same thing as the so-called bodybuilders and stuff. Then how come they're not shredded and ripped and everything else? You just said even a natural bodybuilder. <laughs> Look at this guy. Enzo's giving up. Enzo, you guys can chill. You gotta walk. You know, I take Enzo. I, I live on a very big property, so we do sprints. So Enzo, <laughs> Enzo does like a couple of hundred yards of sprints, one to two times a day, and he goes on two walks. But it's always the same place. I haven't taken him out to a park in a while, so he's very. <laughs> he's loving it. He's pulling me the whole time. He's usually we live, so much better. Than we us. live down by the water, and. Someone may actually, he was up to his, probably about here in the water, and somebody, a little kid, goes, Mommy, look, a polar bear. <laughs> 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 it's a baby polar bear. Oh, I'm like, no, it's that. a dog. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you, you, you know what, you know, <laughs> touching on what Frank was saying, what kind of upsets me the most nowadays is when everyone's like, pointing fingers and saying this guy's not natural forget it we're not talking about ifbb bodybuilders no, 280 everybody. pounds okay we're talking about just like the uh, guy that has a nice physique and these guys mm -hmm. are saying oh he's not natural he's on steroids if he is or he's not forget about him what you're telling yourself is 
if that guy's on steroids, then I can't look like that if I don't take steroids. And mm. that takes me back to when I was a kid. I did not know Arnold took anabolic steroids. I did not know Hulk Hogan took them. And I, I didn't know anything about that. I just looked at them, I said, I want to look like that, and I worked my butt off. And mm -hmm. not much changed week by week, month by month. It was a slow progression. So what did I have to do? I had to study. I studied everything I can find about training, mm -hmm. about different modalities, different techniques, different training intensities, and nutrition. I was shopping, cooking, and I had my own refrigerator at the age of 17. So 10 years went by and I progressed greatly. Now knowing a ton about anabolic steroids at an early age i don't think helps anybody ignorance in this in this in this well, case it no. is a good thing they used to have the little pamphlet by i don't even want to say like uh whatever and then uh, they used to outline all the cycles in it and everything else in there and that was pretty much the whole uh way you would get it and then actually dr bob goldman wrote a book when i was in college that i read in the library it's called death in the locker room i don't know if you ever read that but that was actually interesting but there was nothing like couldn't go online couldn't find out anything. It was a taboo kind of a thing, you know? Listen, it takes a very special personality to not abuse a substance. And forget steroids, even even caffeine, even Adderall, even, even pharmaceutical drugs, regular people. Coffee. If you take something and it <laughs> makes you feel better, or yeah. makes you perform better, it's it's an addictive personality and Absolutely. sometimes human nature to take more and more and more. So for you to limit yourself and control yourself is very difficult. There's a big difference between an athlete taking a performance enhancing mm -hmm. supplement uh, substance to be 15, 20, 30% better and someone that's just addicted to taking drugs oh, and yeah. not putting in the work. Absolutely, we're gonna change gears. Honestly, so you've been in the fitness industry obviously a long time now. What's the stupidest nutritional <laughs> program diet that you've come across lately? Like, uh, you know, there's so much mis misinformation, misconceptions through social media and stuff. So. Like, what do you see recurringly that you feel like is just probably like, you know, not the most intelligent way to... When, when people think that given foods or given structure of foods have like this magical um, occurrence, like you know, beets? like, yeah, like if you eat this food, <laughs> it won't stick to you. You won't turn fat. Like I've mm. seen these products where it's like, oh, you can eat this fattening food, this fattening product, but our version doesn't absorb, it's not soluble. Stop eating like an animal and you won't be fat. Yeah, I mean, look, there's no there's no secret to training. There's no secret to no. dieting. It's very simple and it's something that it's it's longevity. So what I've seen with, with athletes or even just people that are trying to get into shape, when they go to this really intense, low calorie extreme diet, it mm -hmm. doesn't last very long. So that's why people yo-yo. And that's yep. why people lose the weight, get into shape for a wedding, for a show, for the summer, and then no. they go right back to where they are. It's not sustainable. If you're overweight, your fat cells are enlarged and you have more fat cells than someone that's not overweight. Now when you diet down and you get leaner, your fat cells shrink in size, but the amount of them do not reduce. Over time, over the year and years, you will reduce the amount of fat cells. So mm. someone that's overweight, that loses weight still has a lot of fat cells until more time passes. That's why they're able to rebound so hard and so fast and gain that weight back. So I've written tons of programs for like nutrition training, like top 40 information in the world. And what I tell people is this, stop eating what you're eating and stop eating so much. Write down what you're eating in a day for real. Not like, oh, I had a salad, but you forgot about the seven other things that like you stop for coffee and a muffin or this or that. Sit there and write everything that you've eaten down. And then, like a forensic accountant, but the forensic just look and figure that out. Figure what you're doing now. If you're doing that on a daily basis, that's, and if you're living a lifestyle where you're not moving and you're not doing anything, those are the reasons you're fat. It's not very difficult to get in shape. It's mentally getting to that point to want to do it and sustain it. You know, the, we all have choices in our lives to dictate what we're going to look like. So if you choose the wrong nutritional program or the wrong training program or you cease to follow any, you're going to be out of shape unless you're genetically, you know, gifted. Yeah. I mean, you got to think <laughs> back to our ancestors, you know, human yeah. beings didn't work office, office jobs. They didn't no. sit and drive cars all day and eat calorically dense foods. Kill each they other. worked, they worked on fields, they built homes, they were farmers, so they were active. Mm -hmm. They walked to the places they needed to go several miles a day. It was very normal for human beings. And they ate foods that came from the earth that weren't po processed. So a 500 calorie meal of clean, natural, unprocessed food is mm -hmm. about what, this big, let's say? Yep. 
this big. If you go to a vending machine, within <laughs> within one minute, you can consume 2,000 calories with only this much. So you have to understand, like, these processed high calorie foods. There he goes again. That's <laughs> that's the Enzo twirl. It's all. He's it's all what you eat, right, Enzo? He's just happy to be alive. It's all what you eat. But Actually, so when you guys are eating these processed foods, you don't realize, like, when you eat a meal, it takes 15 to 20 minutes for the mechanical digestion to occur, blood sugar to rise, hit a button in your brain, tell you you're full. When you're eating Twinkies or pizza or burger and fries, by the time that happens and your brain tells you you're full, mm -hmm. you've already consumed way too many calories. But if you're eating vegetables and sweet potatoes and chicken breasts, it's Starving. Takes, it takes longer to consume that. <laughs> and you're starving and every he, two hours. <laughs> like if you ever, if you ever interrupted in a meal, you know, if you're ever interrupted in the beginning, in the middle of a meal from a phone call or something, a lot of times you come back, you're not as hungry. That's mm -hmm. the reason. So Dude. eat slower, chew your food, and don't eat calorically dense food. Do you know the slowest eater I've ever seen was a uh, 202 Olympia, Kevin English. Yes. He'd be at the front counter at Bev's eating for an hour and a half with chicken breast with sweet potato. And I'd be trained, I'd come back, I'm like, you still eating? He's like, ah. I wish I was like But then I watch him eat a stack of cookies. <laughs> <laughs> and a, like a diner of pancakes and syrup and he was done and like you know no no but just to get that food down a lot of bodybuilders will complain like even dexter was saying it it's hard to get that food down yeah. you know it's like you don't look forward to eating it like you know we're, we're, we're gonna eat after this right <laughs> <laughs> for sure so now you haven't competed in a while right and obviously it's some medical issues that you said on social on yeah. social media are you going to come back to the stage? How's everything looking right now? I would love to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've been training consistently. I still am, my weight is still fairly high. I'm in the 235, 240 range. Mm -hmm. uh, if I'm 100% and I'm feeling really good, I'd like to make a comeback. I don't want to force it, but I miss it. It wasn't planned for me to stop, so that's really, really tough. It's, it's, it's messed with me mentally. Yeah. When you're forced to stop something and it wasn't your own decision. Um, and what really, really gets to me that I don't want to walk away is that I still feel like I've never been my best. I've always, for you guys that know me and follow me, I've always kind of struggled to make weight. I'll get ready for the show, I look pretty good, but I still have 10 pounds to lose for weigh-in. And that's that was really tough for me with Classic Physique where I just can't make the weight. And I don't have any desire to go to open at the, you know, at the age that I'm at. Um, Grow a high yeah. hair and be a couple well, inches yeah. long so you I, get, get I a couple more I have seen pounds. some Classic Physique guys <laughs> blow drying their hair before. <laughs> have you kind of like, um? like Clubber Lang and Rocky sitting in the audience kind of wanting to get back oh, <laughs> to the well, fight. Have you seen like, what show were you at last that you were like, you know, that you saw the, that you were Olympia. like- The Olympia. The Olympia, When yeah. I was at the Olympia oh, last right, year, at, yeah, I, right. I did the interviews and stuff. Out, yeah. and I was just, I was itching, you know? I was like, oh man, I can't believe him. It was a very I, weird feeling. I remember your way and you're like, He's not, he's, he's not that tall. <laughs> I don't want to say who. He's going to look at his hair. <laughs> he's like, how much is he going to weigh? But yeah. it's so funny, like how that division's blown up. I think we got Chris Bumstead walked from the chairs to the scale at the Olympia. And I think we got 1.6 million views. Wow. Now, if that was on network TV where on like cable che cable television, it's like three, 400,000 views is a hit. Think yeah. about that, 1.6 million. Chris walking from there to there and weighing himself. But for those of you who are aspiring to be classic physique or any other bodybuilding superstars, Chris is not this popular and famous because he's Mr. Olympia. That's the icing on the cake. Chris is a cool, well-rounded, intelligent guy, and he mm -hmm. had a crazy following beforehand. He's providing value. He was doing um, YouTube uh, vlogs. So if you guys are trying to, I have a lot of young guys asking me, mm -hmm. like trying to build their platform. Well, ask yourself what sets you apart from the other million guys yeah. with big arms and a six pack. You have to provide value and you have to talk to people and you have to teach them and share your journey and have some kind of a niche. However, I've seen people with a huge following and people who don't have any following jump into the Olympia. Now the Olympia, how many different countries are watching the Olympia? Their platforms blew up after they did the Olympia because now you're seeing a whole new audience in multiple countries, you know, so they actually built upon them and then they started, people from other countries started following them and then like their fans started talking so it just got hey <laughs> what's going on uh, but the olympia platform is, is amazing for you know getting people out there with, you know uh, especially on um on instagram and uh what up twitter facebook everything else yeah. come here buddy bodybuilding has changed you know it's it's, it's, it's definitely it, changed because it's 
there's more people in the NPC and the IFBB because of uh, men's physique and yes. because of bikini and not because of classic. When I was growing up, bodybuilding was a, is a much smaller niche and you didn't have so many people competing. In it. So do you feel that now you would pack size on and would just go in the open if you wanted to get as big? Because you haven't had the opportunity to be as big as you possibly can You know, when I was younger, I wanted to be Ronnie. I wanted to be Dorian. It's but, never too late. But I don't, I, don't, I don't have desire to be that big anymore. You know, a, a part of me is, you know, you, you want to be a cartoon character and a mass mm. monster, but a part of me just longevity, health, walking around not having back pain not 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 yeah. huffing and puffing walking up a flight of stairs you know like you know i mean like frank is is an, a, a, an amazing example he's not small by any means he's a big guy muscular but he's fit he's healthy he can do yoga he can run he can do martial arts uh he looks like a bodybuilder he takes off his shirt it's impressive like you know that's that's something that i think everybody Look. should aspire to be like i don't want to be this big massive bodybuilder look like a god for 10 years and then not be able to train, be in pain, and be out of shape. You know, when when I um when I started competing, when I was a, a kid, before I started competing, I was 240. Wow. I was 240 pounds. I started training at 13, comp competed at 21. So I was already 240 pounds. Right now I weigh 230. So before I even competed, and I was just training naturally and everything else, 240. Yeah. When I competed, I was 265 on stage. Got up to 314 once in the off season. But when you shrink down from 300 pounds, then I went back down to like 250, and then I just kind of shred up the last you know decade or so. But um, you're identified in everything that you do by being the big guy, the strong guy in the gym. Yeah. When that no longer exists, you almost have to reinvent yourself. How but was that? Mentally and physically, it, it, mentally is the hardest thing to go like, I was like, you know, a superhero. I can bench this, I could do this. And I was the biggest guy always in the room. Like, you're not that person anymore. So a lot of people can't make that transition. You'll see like guys in their 50s and 60s and they're like, they look like the color of cranberry because they're all high blood pressure and everything. And they're like, I just gotta do what? I did 400 for seven. They got torn biceps, torn shred. Like, I didn't want to be that guy. Yeah. But. It's not as how easy. Long, how long did it take you to make that transition and be okay and be happy and confident with not being big? Because I got a taste of that this past two years. Of, yeah. I didn't lose much size, but I didn't look the same. You know, I wasn't, when I was competing, I was hard as nails, granite. I looked like I was 260. Yep. Whereas when I was 240 and I just I got softer, I put on a little bit of mm -hmm. little bit of belly fat, like it really messed with my head. Yeah. And thinking to downsize and get even smaller from there, I, I look at myself, I'm like, I look small. Yeah, you're always gonna, you know what? If you're in the fitness industry, I don't know, you get body dysmorphia. You really don't see what other people see because you see perfection, you want perfection. Yeah. And when you look in the mirror and you're like, ah, you know, I wish I was more shredded. And people are like, you have an eight pack, what's wrong with you? Like, you know, <laughs> what's wrong with you? You're never satisfied, you never stay complacent. And that's what makes somebody, I guess, strive to, to be a, a better, you know what I mean? Like, so you're never stuck. If you're always like, ah, I look great today. I don't even think I have to go to the gym. I wish. You know what I mean? Like, if you, is that thought ever? Never. Come into your head? I, I never. And now when I look back in retrospect, the craziest I ever looked, the best I ever looked was going into shows. Yeah. Did I even stop and enjoy it for a no. second? I'm looking at myself no. every day, tearing myself apart. I need to get my outer suite bigger. I need to get my, my waist smaller. I need to get my back bigger. Yeah. And it was just rough. But how, how long did it take you to kind of make that transition? Was it like so, a few years? Or? Well, I went from the competition at two, 265. I went to 300. I did a ton of photo shoots. I think it was it translated into 30 covers, wow. something like that. So I was 265 when I landed next to the Venice, uh, Miss Marina Pacific Hotel in Venice. There was a pizzeria next door. Every day I'd be in there, calzone, pizza. By the time I left, after my uh, I don't know 100th photo shoot or whatever it was, my feet were this big. I couldn't put my sneakers on. I had to get flip flops to wear on the on the plane. And you know when you start retaining all that sodium, you're like. Well, I should have came in bigger in the show. And then you start to spill over. I was just at the point where I started to spill over. I had abs on top of the gut, wow. veined out. But that was my last show. So that was my last, like, you know, picture. I see myself, like, as being as big as possible. But it took a good year to get to 250 shredded and start doing, like, you know, a yeah, ton of stuff. Yeah, but you're still, 250 is still big. Yeah, but that was kind of like my natural weight. Yeah. And then just for longevity and 
for you know life reasons. I just wanted to get down. So right now, like it's about 2:30, so I fluctuate between 2:25 and 2:35, depending on what crumb cakes. I want to get eat. down to like a shredded 225, 220. I'm 2:35. Uh, yeah, now. I feel better at a lighter weight. I don't know, you know, it's not always about being the biggest guy in the room. Put quality muscle, lean muscle on too, you know, be in condition. I always used to, everyone used to say, oh, anyone can get big arms, but not everybody can have a, a six pack. Do you yeah. know what I mean? It's so, an illusion, you know? Yeah. You see some guys that look small in a t shirt or a sweater, they took their, they take it off, they're shredded, they look huge, you know? Well, yeah, you go to a show and you see, like, if you saw some of the bodybuilders and you're like, they're not that big, and then they take their stuff off and you're like, whoa, yeah. you know what I mean? I think, so, I forgot who said it, but they're like, when you take your shirt off, you should look like an anatomy chart. You know what I mean? Yeah. And in your clothes, you should look like a normal human being. Yeah. So I was like, you know. So well, Rush, what's coming up for you? What's going on? Life, like what's life wise? Yeah. Like life wise, fitness wise. Just working. I'm in I'm in real estate, so I still got some real estate stuff going on. Uh, fitness wise, got some shoots, got some stuff with sponsors coming up. I'm doing a um, a fitness seminar. With uh, with a couple of partners of mine mm -hmm. in uh, either in Vegas or on the West Coast at the end of August, it's going to be called BodyCon. Nice. Um, it's going to be two day seminar, very informative classroom and workshop in the gym, and we're going to have some some top bodybuilders there as well. A couple surprise guests, myself of course, uh, Derek Lunsford will be there, and it's going to be something that I feel like we uh, you haven't seen in the industry where you can come and meet the bodybuilders, talk to them, pick their brain, but. It's very informative. We're covering everything that you can imagine for fitness and bodybuilding, uh, from nutrition to training, different training modalities, and hands-on workshop, of course, in the gym. Awesome. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to that. That's something we're gonna be doing. The first BodyCon will be August 20th and 21st, and then from there, we're gonna probably be doing it more often and maybe traveling um, like East it. Coast, West Coast, and maybe international. And you go to Arash's um, Instagram. What is that, Arash? Uh, just Arash Rabar. My he's Instagram. Being, he's being shadow use. banned. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I need I need you guys' help to uh, to comment, like, follow. Um, making a lot of new content. Let me know what you guys want to hear. Uh, talk a lot about motivational stuff, training, nutrition. I want to teach the things that I've been fortunate enough to learn. Uh, rub shoulders with some of the best in the world, like uh, <laughs> Frank Seppi. But seriously, like when I turned pro, I had the um, I had the privilege of becoming friends with guys that I looked up to. Like again, Frank didn't know who I was. I knew Frank for two decades, and I learned so much from these guys. And, you know, uh, Kevin Lebrone and, and, and Flex Wheeler, just everybody. So it's it's been a privilege, and I like to share with you guys. So let me know what you want to see, and I'll make more. more what about the YouTube content. channel? The YouTube channel also a Rasha Bar. You can see that on my Instagram. There's a link in my link tree, and just actually just filmed some new content last week, and it'll all be dropping for you guys soon. Cool. Well. I want to thank Arash for taking the time for athlete, dog, walk, right? What do we got? What are you calling it, Sophia? Dog, walk, and talk. Athlete, dog, walk, and talk. I want to thank, I want to thank Arash for athlete, dog, walk, and talk. We got Enzo. We got Neo, as always. We're going to have a ton of new episodes with some uh, really significant people in like Arash in the fitness industry, professional sports, and we look forward to bringing it to you on Muscle and Fitness YouTube and all the Muscle and Fitness social media channels. All right, thank you guys. Thanks for tuning in, guys.